Welcome to AP BioFun with Dr. D. And in this tutorial, we're gonna be talking about phylogeny. So I'm gonna start by asking you to look at this image and tell me what kind of animal do you think is shown in this image? Um, and we did this in class, but if you're watching the video again uh, for the first time, sorry, I want you to pause it, answer the question before um, you move on. And if you answered a snake, then you were wrong because this is actually a lizard. This is a legless lizard. Remember convergent evolution. We talked about it in analogous structure. So convergent evolution is when um, organisms that are not related have developed similar adaptations because they live in similar environment. So this particular adaptation being no limbs um, was developed by snakes and a certain type of lizards, um, a few species of lizards independently. So phylogenetics and phylogeny um, really uh, show evolutionary relationship between organisms. So phylogeny is the evolutionary history of a species or a group of related species. Phylogenetic trees are based on the concept, the process of speciation, in the concept of a common ancestor. And phylogenetic trees are actually only models, they're hypotheses. So they're constantly being revised, so keep that in mind. Now phylogeny and classification are two related concepts, but they're not exactly the same. So let's examine this very simple phylogenetic tree. What you will see here in circled in red are branch points. What's a branch point? A branch point is where the tree branches, uh, where the branches split, a point of divergence. A branch point represents a distant common ancestor. And the first branch point that you see here is the common ancestor of species one, two, and three. And then the next red circle branch point is the common ancestor of species one, and two. So this simple tree is the result of two speciation events. The first speciation event is when species X, uh, we call this, um, I call the first branch point species X. Species X is the common ancestors of one, two, and three, species one, two, and three. So the first speciation event really is when species X split into two different species, species Y and species three. Now species Y happens to be the common ancestor of one and two, it is the next branch point, which tells us there is a second speciation event has happened. And in that speciation event, species Y has now split into species one and species two. Now it's important also to understand that species X and Y are no longer. So that tree that we just saw illustrates the evolutionary relationship, the evolutionary relatedness between these three species. And we see that these three species have resulted from two sequential speciation events that I just listed here. Now, because this is what the model tells us, the model tells us that there have been two speciation events, we can draw the model in slightly different way without altering the essential information. For instance, Instead of writing species one and species two here at the top, okay, one is on the left and two is on the right, I could simply write two on the left and one on the right. So I could flip these two branches. This will not change the fundamental information this model provides, namely that species Y, which is this branch point right here, is the common ancestor of both species one and species two. Okay, and then this is the second speciation event that has occurred after the first one right here. So these branch points are also called nodes and a tree can be rotated around the nodes without actually changing the essential information provided by that tree. We can even flip it even further. So if I were to examine the tree this way, now I'm gonna start with species three and then proceed to species one and two. So I have now rotated around this node, around species X, the first branch point, 
that also fundamentally does not change the information the street provides. There are still two speciation events. The first yielded species three um, and that species, which is the common ancestor to species one and two. And the second speciation event will now lead uh, to the formation of species one and species two. So rotating a tree around the nodes does not fundamentally alter uh, the model, which the tree represents about the evolutionary relatedness of these species. So the trees also, this tree, you will see how the species are pointing upwards. I could rotate that uh, tree 90 degrees and now the species can be pointing towards the right. So it could go from left to right. Um, I could also draw the tree this way. Um, instead of angular, they're more like um, rectangular branches. Uh, so it does not change how we interpret it. It's just a, a different type of drawing and you should be familiar with both. And again, this tree that you're seeing here could also be pointing upward. So we can rotate it 90 degrees counterclockwise. And the numbers are the branch points. And remember the branch points are the recent common ancestors. They're the points of divergence. They're the start of a speciation event. So number one is the common ancestor for all of these. Um, and I'll explain later what a tax on it. So taxa A through G have one common ancestor and that's number one. A speciation event led to the formation of taxon G and number two. Number two is an ancestor, common ancestor of A through F. Number two, once the species, another speciation event occurs, gives rise to number three and number five. Number three is a common ancestor uh, of A through C. And number five is the common ancestor of D through F. Another speciation, events, uh, speciation event occurs here and three splits into A and four. And yet another speciation event split four into B and C. And B and C are considered sister taxa. So a speciation event uh, can lead to further speciation events. So we can actually follow the speciation events in time. We start with one, then we went two, three, four, and so on. Now, if we look at five, we see that five yielded three different species. And this branch point forms an unresolved pattern of divergence. Normally a speciation event lead to the splitting into two different species, right? So speciation event in three yielded A and four. Okay, and then four yields B and C. Here we see that five yields three different taxons, which means we're not quite sure whether this was a single speciation event or there's a speciation event we're missing. And why is that? Well, the data we have, is somewhat limited. The further back we go in time, the few data, fewer, less data we have to determine evolutionary relationship between organisms. And we're gonna talk more about this a little bit later but it's important that you recognize the major components of a phylogenetic tree. And as usual, remember, we can flip. We can write C and B as opposed to B and C, right? So we can rotate around four, we can rotate around three, we can rotate around two, around five, around one. So we can flip the tree and this will not change the evolutionary relationship between um, the organisms. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about classification or taxonomy. Now, as a result of evolution, Earth is populated by many, many different organisms, all with different traits. Now, scientists have long ago, not just scientists, but humans in general, felt the need to classify and organize uh, organisms and group them. So we group organisms according to their similar characteristics, naturally. Um, and classifications have changed over the years. Uh, but basically, classification relies on grouping and naming of organisms according to their evolutionary relationships and their shared characteristics. Now remember, shared characteristics are evidence of evolutionary relationship, but not always. So early classification systems relied mostly on observable characteristics. Um, and while these could be considered as evidence for evolutionary relatedness, they're not always evidence. Remember the snake that is not a snake. So, here is the current classification system we have, or the one that you might be familiar with. Uh, you might have learned in middle school that King Philip 
came over for a great soup or King Philip, um, what was it? Came over for great spaghetti. I forget all the mnemonics, which tells you that it's a hierarchical system with each uh, level smaller and smaller. We have kingdoms, we have phylums, class, order, family, genus, and species. The smallest taxon is uh, the species. Okay, in the species, we use a binomial system where the species name is uh, comprised of its genus name and a unique um, second word, second name. A taxonomic unit at any level of hierarchy is called a taxon. Um, now, over the years, the number of kingdoms has kept changing. So I can tell you that over the years since I started, and I haven't been teaching uh, in high school that long, but since I started teaching high school science, the number of kingdoms has changed, I think, twice or maybe even three times. Um, so that means, and, and organisms keep being reshuffled into different um, categories. So that means that this system of classification um, is not perfect. It constantly needs revisions. So if we were to um, extrapolate from here, so this is the class hierarchical classification system and turn this into a phylogenetic tree, it will look something like this, right? So you have an order, an order is split further into families, families are split into genuses, and then each genus could be a single or multiple species. Um, so that classification system really reflects evolution of relatedness, but it's not perfect. So this is how phylogenetics and classifications relate, because as I said, they're not the same thing. Phylogenetics can be used to refine classification. Okay, so the tree of life. Why am I showing you the tree of life? The tree of life is the biggest phylogenetic tree. Why? Because it encompasses all currently living forms as well as all um, organisms that once lived but are now extinct that we know of. Because remember that not all organisms fossilize and leave a fossil record, leave a record of their existence. And it is also important to understand that the majority of organisms that have once inhabited Earth are no longer living. Now the tree will never be complete because as I said, we don't know of every organism that has once inhabited Earth. But the tree of life reflects our current knowledge. Um, and new species are constantly being discovered. So we even have currently living organisms that we have not discovered. So the tree of life is always being revised and added to, but it does represent the model of how we um, understand that life is organized, how we group and classify organisms based mostly on their evolutionary relationship. But should we, um, is, is really the tree based on shared characteristic or is it based on evolutionary relationship? Are the two excluded, um, excluding ways to, to do it or not? That, that's the question. Well, phylogenies really are inferred from both morphological and molecular data, right? And the basic principle of phylogeny is that organisms that have similar morphologies, that means they have similar structures, similar characteristics, or similar DNA sequences are likely to be more closely related than organisms with different structures and sequences. I mean, you're likely to be more um, I would like to make this analogy, even though it's an imperfect one. You're likely to be, um, you're likely to look more like uh, your siblings than your uh, third cousins, because you're more closely related to your siblings than you are to your third cousins. You're more likely to look to your like your parents than you are to look like your great, 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 great grandparents, because you're more closely related to your parents. Now the similarities we used to infer phylogenies must result from shared ancestry. But how do we determine shared ancestry? So remember the similarities between snakes and Ladyos lizard. Um, the similarities are obvious, but these similarities are the result of analogous, um, of convergent evolution. They're analogous structures. They're not homologous structures. So they're not the result of shared ancestry. So how do we go about and determine shared ancestry? How do we know that um, the legless lizard and the snakes are really um, don't have any recent common ancestors. You have to go really lots, a, a lot back in time 
to find a common ancestor? How do we know that this feature, no limb, is really an analogous structure, not a homologous structure? It's not based on shared ancestry. In other words, snakes and legless lizards have um, developed no limbs independently as a result of convergent evolution. How do we know that? Well, the short answer really is, and even if, if I give you a lot more details and more complications, that'll still remain the best answer is, we don't just use one feature to determine how related organisms are. So multiple, multiple characteristics have to be examined for us to build a phylogenetic tree just like this one. It isn't just the presence or absence of legs. We're gonna look at other features at other characteristics of these organisms. And these trees are constantly being revised based on new evidence. And most importantly, based on molecular data that is comparing sequences of DNA, sequences of RNA molecules and protein molecules and determining how closely related organisms are. So in other words, phylogenetic classification is, uses multiple, multiple um, categories of evidence to be constructed because it is used to show evolutionary relationship. So in order to show evolutionary relationship, um, the process really stresses common ancestors and relies on the amount of differences within a group to construct the tree. And common ancestry and amount of differences are inferred from the fossil record, from morphology, from embryological development, from molecular data. So basically all categories of evidence for evolution that we discussed are used if possible, whenever the data is there to um, construct phylogenetic trees. So phylogenetic trees, because they're used to show evolutionary, evolutionary relationship, need to rely on multiple pieces of evidence. And as I said, and I'm gonna say it several more times, phylogenetic trees are just hypotheses, they're models. So they're constantly being revised as new evidence comes in, okay? Now, it's also important to remember that any tree, you can, construct a tree based on a few shared characteristics. You can construct a tree based solely on molecular data. Um, of course, scientists that, that do this usually rely on multiple pieces of data, but you could sit down and construct a tree based on uh, just um, a collection of data, let's say um, morphology. And it is important for you to understand that if the tree is based solely on morphology, it is less accurate um, than a tree which is based solely on molecular data. So trees that are based on molecular data are actually tend to be more accurate in terms of determining evolutionary relationship between organisms. So here is one of my favorite examples of, of how trees have been revised based on molecular data. How would you group these two animals, right? So one is a whale, the other one is a cow. They're both mammals, we know that. We know whales are not fish, they're mammals. Uh, so clearly they have a common ancestor, but they have markedly different characteristics. The cow has four legs, uh, the whale has flippers, right? So based on fossil records and mostly based on DNA comparison, we know now how to classify whales and we know that whales are actually closely, closely related to cows, to sheep, to goats, to hippos, to four-legged hooves um, animals because whales, um, or rather an ancestor of the whales used to live on land and have four legs. So molecular phylogenetics is a new branch of phylogenetics that has exploded in the past 50 years um, thanks to the availability of whole genome sequencing. So basically we can know every letter in the DNA of many, many, many different organisms. So advances in technologies and sequencing technologies, and some of you I know um, actually ended up reading a little bit about next generation sequencing during our biotechnology unit. Sequencing is now cheap and fast and we have more and more genomes of more and more organisms, the whole genome. That means we know every letter of DNA for that particular species. And uh, new software and better software and algorithms help us actually very fast assemble these genomes, compare them to each other. And 
Um, this requires uh, a new discipline, which is called bioinformatics, which involves computer algorithms that compare sequences from multiple organisms. And based on these comparisons, these we can do infer evolutionary relationship between organisms. Now, the comparison is actually quite complex and cannot be done uh, just by looking at sequences. It's done by complicated computer algorithms, computer programs. Um, the comparison involves aligning the sequences, so um, basically aligning them one on, under each other and determining what, where the similarities are, where their difference, are there any gaps in the alignment. Um, here is one example. Here we have just, compa we're comparing just 20 characters of, um, of a gene. I don't even know which gene that is. Uh, and several different species of primates. And you can see um, that certain positions um, are identical in all four species. So the first four positions are identical. And in position seven, you see one difference. Um, in position nine, there's another difference and so on. So we can determine where the letters in DNA are different and where they're actually missing letters uh, or letters inserted. And of course, as I said, this is done with computers. So um, it's, it actually analyzes the data for you. So the best, again, I'm going to say it again, the best hypothesis, the best model for phylogenetic trees fit the most data. So they use morphological data, they use molecular data, they use fossil data. Um, and as new evidence emerges, they're being revised. Um, because they're models, they allow us also to predict features of ancestors and their extinct descendants based on the features of closely living descendants and think dinosaurs. So I'm going to stop here. We're gonna continue this next class for now. Goodbye.